Hello, everyone. I'm Donna Merck, director of the South Dakota Art Museum. Welcome to the first virtual artist chat featuring artists from the GIFT exhibition curated by Dr. Craig Howe of the Center for, of American Indian Research and Native Studies in Martin, South Dakota. We are so happy that you're here tonight. This virtual artist chat is made possible through the generous support of museum donors like you because the South Dakota Art Museum receives operational funding from South Dakota State University and the South Dakota Arts Council, your donations, memberships, and gifts fund fantastic exhibitions and programs like this. So thank you all. And much, much thanks to our artists who are here tonight. And we're gonna shortly hear from four artists featured in the gift, which is right now on display at the South Dakota Art Museum in Brookings, through July 31st, the exhibition is based on the traditional Lakota narrative of the white buffalo woman and includes artworks, poems, and music by 39 Lakota creatives. Joining us tonight are visual artists Dwayne Wilcox, Roger Brower, Keith Braveheart, and John Gozencenter. Each artist will share about themselves and their artwork, followed by a brief Q&A. Please save questions for the end of the program or feel free to put them in the chat during the program and we'll relay them afterward. Abigail Ramsbottom, Curator of Education, and Taylor McEwen, Curator of Collections, will introduce each artist and will moderate the Q&A at the end of the program. Taylor, Abby, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think what we'll do instead is, Roger, if you're good, we'll have Roger Brower start us off. So Roger is an artist residing in Hill City, South Dakota, and I will let you take it away. Well, that was a little loop you threw at me right off. Uh, I thought Wilcox was going to go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just figured since he just got home to give him a second to kind of oh, find his bearings, uh, if you're okay uh, with well, that. I'm 76 years old, so I better go first because I might <laughs> not make it through the end. Uh, um, I'm Roger Brewer. I live in Hill City, South Dakota. Um, my studio is down the hill from my house, and it, it's... Uh, I collect cardboard. Anybody walks in there would think that I just have a, a huge cardboard collection. Um, and a lot of other things on the walls, and it just, it, it's quite a, quite a jumble. So I don't know, um, I don't know exactly where, you know, the, the influence for work comes from. I mean, I've been at this, I've been in this business since, uh, I think 1972. So a long, long time. And, and, uh, I've seen many things and been all over the world and, and, uh, and, and I, I still, I try to do things that are meaningful, that are precious and, and are very precious to me. So I, I, I try to speak when I'm, when I'm working, we're all storytellers. And I guess I try to speak um, about the things that are the most uh, personal to me. Um, I, she's gonna put some slides up here in a minute. And I can talk about that. Okay, the, the first, this is the piece that's in the, in the, in the ex exhibit, um, the, the, the gift exhibit. This is the Chanupa that, um, that the white buffalo calf woman brought to our people. Oh, no, no, just go back. There you go. And um, I, I wanted to have it, have um, a feel of a, of like an old um, tin type or daguerreotype a photograph in a way that would kind of talk about its antiquity. And, but I wanted it to be very, very simple and, and humble. And that when we're, we're we Lakota people are, work, are with the, the Chinook or the pipe, it's, it's, very, it's a very humbling experience. And we have to remember that. And I think that's why I, I just this piece seems very 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 simple, but in a in a sense it's it's also very complicated, personally complicated. I'm going to see here eventually, 
is is a European fashion uh, painted uh, bear. And um, a lot of times people, you'll find in my work, I, I use animals in the place of humans. Um, just because um, I, 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 I want to make that connection between human and, and our relatives, the bears and the eagles and the prairie dogs and, and all different kinds of things. And, and um, so I'm, I'm getting ready for a show now over at the, at the um, Brinton Museum in September. Richard Red Owl, Red Owl and I are doing a show together over there. And I started, um, st I started out that show, when I started producing that show, I, I thought, well, maybe I should just do some, do some work that people can readily understand. And so I did that bear. Nice. And it's just, it's, they're all oils, except one of these pieces that I've sent as an uh, example or is a monoprint. Okay, go ahead to the next one, please. And then this, and then, so I, I went from that to a, to a thing where I'm, I'm allowing this sort of anthropomorphic thing to, to develop. I'm not so, I'm getting less interested in subject matter, but more interested in, more interested in um, uh, my brush strokes and, and, uh, and, and I guess the, the hidden nature of what it, what it's about. Um, and, and uh, the painting is more important than the product. So, uh, okay, go to the next one. Okay, this was a, a result of the next one. And you can, yeah, this, this was a monoprint. And I took that monoprint and flipped it over because to do a monoprint, you have to paint backward, which I, which I did. And then I flipped it back and did the painting with this as a reference. And, and you see it changed to some extent, but not, not entirely. And, and then we'll go to the next one then. And, and the next one is, is a, um, is a monoprint. I have in my studio, a skull, a Buffalo skull with a, a lot of things hanging from it, uh, prayer sticks and, and some uh, crowns and bracelets and things that uh, sun dancers use. And I just have that hanging there. And looking from one room in my studio into the other, I saw this bear. So up the left side and across the top is like the wall and the ceiling. But this bear is hanging from strings. And it, it seems it's th this is kind of a little bit of a dark piece. And I and I, I've been told that and and I'm not worried about that because sometimes your thoughts are dark, you know, because when I'm working, I don't really necessarily think about the subject I'm doing. I'm, I'm more interested in thinking about the emotion that's involved or the motion or the sound or the uh, tempo. So there's a lot of things go into a work that uh, a lot of people wouldn't even consider being being a possibility. I'm not wor I'm not too worried about how it comes out. I'm more interested in how I get there. And that's about all I have to say. <laughs> that was enough, I guess, huh? I, I probably incite some questions. So if people have questions, you're welcome to ask me because I if I don't have an answer, I'll make something up. <laughs> <laughs> and we will have some time for questions at the end, but Roger, I did want to ask you, what surface are you using for your mono prints? The Is mono prints, I'm, I'm doing the painting itself on, uh, I use a three inch uh, soft rubber brayer and I use oil. I don't use uh, uh, inks, the inks smell funny and they're sticky. So I use oil and I'm printing on dry um, uh, BFK Reeves paper. And it's a hand burnish technique. I don't use a press, so that that that's a whole that's a whole different different realm. 
but it's very rapid. I have to work really, really fast. And, and so I don't have time to think about, about, um, about the, about the subject. You think of that before you start and then go. Um, but my paintings are all done on linen. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Dwayne will cue you up next. Dwayne is joining us from Rapid City, so I'll I'll turn it over to you, Dwayne. I really don't have um, the the uh, all these Zoom meetings. I don't know how people get their pictures up there, but. If somebody wants to go to my website and look at it, uh, it's just way. Oh, well, there we go. Here's a picture as we're talking about magic. <clears throat> yeah, this is the morning that she was introducing the pipe and how to use it, and uh, so you could see that this is a one of the long lodges. It wasn't a, wasn't one teepee. It was several teepees, and the sunlight came through. So, according to kind of the story I heard of this. Uh, from one person. Well, anyway, she, in her hair, she's got the tuft of buffalo hair that's tied to her hair. And uh, yeah, I use the uh, kind of the ledgerist style of old ledgerist style of faces and things. And that's why it kind of has a, a archaic look, I guess. It's not really my, um, what I'm known for is my paintings. I mean, I'm, I paint a few things, but I, it's not really what I'm known for. But this was um, one of those things that uh, Craig Howe come up and uh, said, this is the part you get. And, um, and you know, you got probably three sentences. This was from uh, LaPointe's um, rendition, I guess, of, of this story, because I've heard little off, little things that were off from it. But, you know, this is kind of like I captured maybe out of those three sentences, this, this image and uh, everybody coming together and in one place and um, having this moment and uh, changing the world, I guess, is a way to speak about it. But uh, for those of you who don't know me, I guess I should introduce myself. I'm, I'm Dwayne Wilcox. Uh, I live in Rapid City, South Dakota. I um, uh, well, I'm looking at myself now. What the heck? <clears throat> Boy, these digital cameras really put the age on you. Um, uh, uh. I just recently published a book called Visual Language, and I just found out to this morning that it won. Um, really bragging here. Uh, it won a honorable mention in. Um, the um, in uh, the uh, Atkin uh, competition, highly prestigious. It says here. <laughs> I don't know about that, but out of two thousand five hundred entries from independent and university presses from across fifty five genres, mine I got an honorable mention in. Uh, popular culture, which is strange because it was uh, on ledger art and most of it was kind of a kind of biographical in a way. Some of it was just stories. Some of it was just uh, my sarcasm about popular culture. But um, if uh, you get a chance, buy one because I, I need the money. They're all, I think they're going for $20 or something like that. I don't know. Um, <laughs> other than that, I've been doing artwork for... Uh, I keep saying professionally since 1987, and uh, actually, it's all I've always done artwork. It's just that I didn't start selling it until 1987. I, my first art um, commission I did was for the Arrow Factory uh, in Wombly, South Dakota, uh, that I did a, a mural, and, uh, and that was in like 1974. And uh, that was the first time I ever got paid for art and I, I should have stuck with it, but instead I got a job and decided to do that for a while and found out that uh, I'm better at art than I am at jobs. So thank God I went back to the, doing the art stuff. I had way more fun. It's been a long, cool journey. With that, I'm done. Huh. MK 
Okay, well, thank you so much. And we're going to move to Keith Braveheart. And sorry, one second, I lost my screen. Right. Thank you, uh, Roger. Thank you, Dwayne. It's always good to hear um, both of you and to see you both. And same with John as well, too. Um, so for, for my section, I have some images. I'm going to share my screen. And I'll start with um, kind of an introduction. So um, the images that I'm going to include, I'll just kind of um, kind of make that aware. They're all of my contributions to uh, Dr. Craig Howe's exhibitions under Karen's. So I thought it'd be nice and fitting to kind of include those uh, tonight. But a little introduction of myself. Um, my name is Keith Braveheart, for those who don't know me. And I come from the area which is called Pejutahaka. Um, it's also known as Kyle, South Dakota. But recently they changed the name to Little Wound. Um, and this is where my family is from. And this is where my upbringing and kind of my whole development, um, you know, is about when it comes to my art. So I always like to kind of start with that um, introduction. And um, uh, when I graduated from Little Wound High School, um, I was accepted into the Oscar Howe Summer Art Institute at the University of South Dakota. And that was really a life-changing moment for me because it introduced me to contemporary Native art. I was aware of art, but I never fully was aware of art until that moment. And this is when I was like 18 years old, just fresh out of high school. But I remember seeing Oscar Howe's work for the first time and just how amazed it was um, of a sensation, a visual sensation, but also a spiritual sensation. Like I felt like his artwork was alive. I really thought that it was breathing. There was something there that was transcendent, that was really remarkable. And that's why I always have to remember that and, and discuss it when I talk about myself as an artist. And you can see that influence in some of my work. You know, so I've seen Oscar Howe's work for the first time, uh, but then also, you know, the um, ones that preceded him, that followed him, his students mainly, but also this whole kind of guard of, who would become our, um, you know, masters of tribal, our Northern Plains tribal arts is what we say. And these are contemporary artists. So not just looking at art as how it's been romanticized or stereotyped, but really how it was being, um, you know, embraced and thriving as an art of today in its time. That included really uh, great masters that I, I look up to still, Bobby Penn, um, Donald Montalo, Arthur Amiot, but also a whole nother group that I, I, I uh, call the Dreamcatchers era, which includes um, Roger. So we're very fortunate to have Roger here with us as well too tonight. I know he talked about his age, but you know he's, he's been uh, doing a lot of great work for uh, a big majority of his life. And so artists like myself who followed, we do have to um, you know, give acknowledgements to these artists. But I won't cut off only at that era because I also saw uh, Dwayne Wilcox's piece. I saw a little ledger he had. Dwayne, you probably remember it. it was like these guys all pushing the van and trying to get to the powwow. But I remember seeing that for the first time, but seeing the name of the uh, title next to the artwork and it said Dwayne Wilcox. And I knew that name, but I also saw the tribal affiliation, Oglala Lakota. And that made me really feel proud. Like, oh man, these guys are you know, from my homelands, these are Lakotas who are out there doing it. They're in the museums. And that was like really inspiring and motivational. So following that Oscar House Summer Art Institute, I went to the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is where I really gained my formal training in arts, but also kind of a real, um, I guess, shaking up, you know, because you're a young person, there's a lot of distractions in the world, especially coming from the res. Uh, there could be a lot of like limitations possibly. But I think when I got to school um, and also being like motivated unspokenly by all these artists whose work I was looking at, they kept me uh, committed. And I saw my way through and I got my uh, bachelor's in fine arts from the Institute of American Indian Arts. And I returned home. I returned back to South Dakota, experienced life, enjoyed just kind of being out and about with my community and my relatives. Uh, and getting a little bit more exposure professionally, started to exhibit my work uh, locally, Pine Ridge, Rapid City, statewide, starting to go out to Sioux Falls, uh, and then regionally as well too. But uh, I would also make a decision to return back to uh, school and I would pursue my master's degree in fine arts at the University of South Dakota. And while I was there, I really focused on painting, um, but also it was at this time kind of when 
uh, Dr. Howe approached me about being a part of these exhibitions. And I enjoyed that because I remember reading these narratives that he was focusing on. And I also, like Dwayne kind of mentioned, had my own accounts of those narratives, those creation stories. We say Ohunkanka and Lakota uh, language, but these are our oral traditions. This is a part of our identity. So to me, it was really important, much more than just a, uh, you know, something to illustrate. It was something that was almost a responsibility like I had to give back to visually as an artist. So it was really compelling to be a part of these exhibitions. Uh, it was fun, it was challenging, but it was also very just uh, exciting to also, again, still be uh, alongside these artists that I still continue to look up to, but also I cherish them. I, I do hold a lot of what they represent as who they are uh, in my heart. And so that kind of is another reason why I make a decision to be a part of such uh, exhibitions. Um, I do market my work. I do other things as well, too. Currently, I'm the um, associate professor, instructor of art here at the Oglala Lakota College. I've been here for four years now. Um, so I'm really kind of putting a lot more of my energy into helping younger artists, my students, come up and find their way. Uh, but I still make time to make art uh, if I can. Um, but also I'm involved in community engaged arts as well, too. That's kind of something that just fulfills me. I feel really good about uh, working with others and bringing art to those who probably would never encounter it if it didn't come to them. So that's kind of a little bit of who I am and a lot about my intentions of what I do as an artist. And then these are the works that are part of uh, Karen's exhibitions. This is the one that's in the gift. I titled it Returning to Them. So that's kind of my bit. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'll kind of give us a break. You do still have four minutes if you do have more to say, but we can also keep moving forward. Sure, I'm good with uh, whatever. All right, moving forward. Thank you, Keith. And I'll introduce uh, John Gosen Center, who's joining us from Rapid City. I believe Carolyn will share his slides. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the venue. And uh, I guess I could even go so far as to thank uh, Craig for all the exhibitions he's organized, because I too have been part of them. Uh, but this in particular one, the gift is a uh, the section that he gave me to create something for, you know, I can truthfully say that these, uh, I guess we call them ceremonies, but uh, I, I have uh, participated in a lot of these ceremonies that uh, belonged, that were brought to us by the White, White Buffalo Calf Woman. So even the piece that I created for Humblecha comes from, uh, uh, my experience is there, so there's nothing really uh, kind of like uh, fabricated from an idea. It was actually experience, you know, so that's something I wanted to acknowledge about what it is that these art shows actually do for us artists. They cause us to reach inside ourselves, you know, to <clears throat> tell these stories. Um, I, I am, uh, what, I, what I call to uh, help people understand what I do is I'm a uh, personal adornment, uh, creative. Uh, the word artist always kind of seems to sort of like uh, channel me to something that I guess I, I still am trying to understand. But I do want to acknowledge that, that I was um, exposed to what I call original first and second generation uh, reservation uh, relatives. That would be my my uh, grandmother and her brothers. And then of course my mother, these are all generational people that uh, came you know, to live on a reservation, struggle and yet uh, become successful. I, so I have those to look upon as far as my influences. Myself, I've had an eclectic career, so I can't fall into the category of artist because I did get a degree in museum studies, but I also uh, work for a major computer company. And 
followed a tech, tech career of 17 years and ended up uh, working for a lot of tribes in geographic information systems. So I'm proud of that service for Native of an Indian country by helping doing some, especially up in Canada with the treaty process, helping them develop their maps for a treaty process. I did teach at a tribal college technology, but in the background, uh, I've also uh, I've served on boards of directors of different art museums, in particular, the Denver Art Museum. I had a tenure there of nine years uh, in, in the middle nineties there. And then also uh, uh, the South Dakota Art Museum as well. I've been on the board of directors there. But eclectic career there, I've always, in the background, I've done uh, making things. And that's why I, I make that connection to the original inhabitants of our reservation who influenced me. Uh, I, I uh, started my creativity as a little boy being given a dance outfit. So I've, I've, uh, I've always been adjusting and fixing and recreating my dance outfits. So that's maybe my origins, you know, but I, I take heart to all those people that contributed to my dance outfit because they are uh, creators as well. And they, they're the soul of our culture. So the things that I create, I actually have great influence by those original inhabitants of the reservation first and second generation of creative people. So, uh, but I, I, like I said, I'm a personal dormant uh, creator because I think that's one of the truest forms of our creativity as Lakota people is because we embellish what we wore, what we lived on, what we used, you know, what we lived in. All these things had some kind of symbology and purpose, you know, um, let's go to the first slide because this, this is something I want to uh, also explain. As an adornment artist, I get, I get a, a direction or an idea, and uh, this comes from the story about Tapu Shawi, which was one of a Craig House exhibition, and, and it has to do with, like, like the narrative says, um, uh, Tapu Shawi, she married a star. While living in the star world, she went out to dig the nutritious timsula, tubers with long tap roots. As she up, she felt this in the world below and became homesick. She had the timsula hunter rope and tried to climb down to fell to her death, posthumously giving birth to Starboy. He became a, a, a Lakota, I guess they, um, uh, you know, he's a hero. <laughs> Her, her star husband in his solitary grief became the stationary star. So as an adornment artist, you know, I, uh, I created this from the agates that we find here in our homeland. And I braided them together and made a brooch out of that. So that's something where it's, it's founded in the Lakota stories. So that's something that I really uh, inspired to is using elements from our homeland, you know, things that uh, you don't really find in Hobby Lobby, I would say. <laughs> Next slide. Hello. Okay, so this is another piece that I had created for another one of uh, Craig's uh, shows. Uh, you can see I've done silver work and I, I mastered that just starting when I worked at the uh, Henderson Museum in Boulder, Colorado. I was exposed to a lot of uh, uh, equipment techniques. I did learn uh, being self-taught silver work, you know, so the, and engraving, so that enhances a lot of my work is engraving, but also the South Dakota agate found in the Lakota homeland is also one of the features of my creativity. So this piece is called We Hum Humbla Wojuha, which means a dream container. So as a creation to help move beyond the memory and historical trauma that led to the plight of the Lakota today, this work of art invites the idea to dream again. It was said that the sacred hoop was broken at the Wounded Knee Massacre, but today we are healing and gaining 
again, master of mirror, again, master's of our universe. The buffalo is returning and with our spiritual sovereignty. Iconic within Plains Army culture, the hollow buffalo horn cap serves as a worthy receptacle for a dream. As a creative personal ceremonial adornment, it also serves as a protective talisman. So this is a, a hand braided cord of buffalo leather as well as the buffalo horn. And it's a cap with an agate on it with a embellished and engraved uh, four directions symbology on it. I did this for the, um, the Y collection, Talk Away, you know, so it's just a symbol of hope that we have. And, but I know I, I've visited Wounded Knees Massacre site many times in my lifetime. But it's just something to help us move. And I wanted to honor, I guess, the, the, those that were killed at Wounded Knee, that we could go on and live their lives that they didn't get to live as Lakota people. So it's those kind of things that inspire my work as an adornment artist. Next. And this is the piece for the, um, the gift show. And this really was a piece that I put together based on my experiences at the, uh, during the Humble H. I was out for four days, three nights and the fourth day. There were some tremendous things that happened, but as a result, I was given a direction to, to create something. And this speaks to what Lakotas did long time ago. And that's why I honor all those people that in my past that have influenced me, but I need to keep these things going as far as Lakota adornment. This is a Tabloka Pejuta, medicine bull, or Peganaka. And it's something that I, I, that I could never sell so it's something that I know that I will wear personally because it embodies a lot of the spirits and uh, the help I need will get from these beings that have come to visit me, especially the yellow flicker. And that's what I'll wear in my hair. And the silver effigy is uh, the buffalo bull. And the silver conchos are, have symbology of there for the four directions and walking on the the lightning there too. So all meaningful things that, you know, if I had to do, like I was asked to create something for the Hamblecha narrative, this is the, a true expression of an experience based on Hamblecha. Uh, well, that's about all I have to say for now, but uh, I'm willing to take questions. And next slide, you can see where to contact me and see more of my work. And uh, I, I do invite questions and all that on my website or either on my uh, Facebook page. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Heath, Roger, Dwayne, and John. Thank you very much. Yeah, again, we. Open it up for questions. Uh, feel free to either unmute yourself and ask questions or drop them in the chat. Um, I do think we have a couple here already. Uh, Keith, uh, someone's wondering, can you discuss the iconography in your piece, specifically um, the smaller figures uh, on each side and the side views of the subjects in your piece that's in the gift? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, if you want, I can even share the screen and just bring that image up again one more time. That'd be great. Um, just so you guys can see. I guess um, just to try to briefly give this description, it is de directly um, pulled from the passage that was shared with me. But it's also, I believe, just, again, a good reminder about what does that um, gift represent, really that spirituality that was brought in the form of this uh, chanupa, that symbol of the pipe. So I didn't need to ha include the pipe because I think the knowledge is uh, um, understood in a Lakota perspective. And I also, uh, similar to how some of the, the other artists have mentioned their um, lived experience behind their expression. To me, it's always like this, um, how do you witness that giving of a pipe? And it's in a certain kind of ceremonial context of being offered to those people still today 
So some of the times you don't even see the actual pipe, but you just remember to see this person sitting there with that pose of like they were holding it and now it's been uh, received. It's, it's being put to use out there somewhere and how it should be used. So it's not just the literature that we're drawing from, it's really a, like a life, you know? So for me, it was like, how do I express that? Well, I'm gonna rely upon just the visual elements that I depend upon all the time when I'm creating paintings, two-dimensional art, color, and like uh, Roger said, brush stroke. A lot of the expressive um, kind of mark making is what's important to me behind a lot of my work, but also the unpredictability, the trust of just allowing paint trips to occur are things that could be disfigured or, or, or messed up, you know, things that can be intentionally uh, destructive or disruptive, you know, that's all part of this uh, duality of harmony that's behind that um, gift, you know, what does this mean? And it's all explained in those passages. If you read all of them continuously, you'll start to understand it. There's going to be all of these things. There was a prophecy behind this uh, figure, this white buffalo calf woman, Thaisanwi, and what she was really saying to the people is not just like, you know, on this day, but into the future, forever, longevity of who you are as Lakota people. So a lot of that is just being referenced. And I do acknowledge the above, the sky, the earth, through the colors, Tate Topa, the four winds, the four uh, cardinal winds represented by their uh, colors. But then also one of the things that I really included as my own kind of just uh, contribution in a sincere way is this little center right here that represents really the Pateoyate, the Buffalo Nation and the Lakota people and who we are ancestral uh, origins. It's represented that we're still, you know, connected to her. We're still being uh, protected and watched over and cared for by this figure. It's not just a character in a, in a narrative. It's really actually one of our really eldest relatives. So it's important. But again, the, the passage itself that was, you know, specific to me included the men. So they're kind of depicted on the sides in a way that's also paying homage to the old winter counts that were um, trying to document these figures in a way as well too. Uh, sorry if I didn't answer your <laughs> question directly the way you was hoping to, but that's kind of just a lot of the background. Oh, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> and we have a question for Dwayne. Um, Donna says, it seems from the instruments behind you that you are multi-talented. Does music impact the, wo the work that you do? You're, you're muted. No, I'm in a pawn shop. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've had guitars, uh, that one kind of over my right shoulder. I had that longer than I had my wife. And I always make that joke that it still has the same shape. And she said, she always calls me something dirty after I say stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I, I try to play them still. I'm still trying to learn. It's like everything in life. Yeah. Uh, I, I've never mastered anything. I, you just keep going at it no matter what it is. I, I like guitars and I like playing music, but I have no, no interest in getting up in front of people and playing at all. I mean, it's a private thing, just like a lot of fishing. I just like to do that kind of alone or with one guy, you know, and that's it. <laughs> well, I want to make this space if um, any of you want to respond to each other's works or if you had thoughts or questions, um, that would be wonderful as well. I have a, I have a question for Roger. Uh, the other night, uh, geez, I got so used to watching old TV shows, I started watching um, Night Gallery. Uh, it was on so in uh, they had an image on there and it was really grotesque. And, and I, I, I don't know how familiar you are, but I remember uh, Roger once described the genre of work that he did as grotesque, you know, and uh, see, I'm, I'm not trained in art. So uh, after watching that little half hour series, it, it kind of enlightened me on how that, how that uh, twist comes along in, uh, in the art world it, through, uh, I guess, somebody's emotional way of, of dealing with it rather than just the uh, visual way of dealing with it. Just ask Roger that if that's the, if the, that 
I may have heard him say that before, but I don't remember. Uh, but is that what he would call that? Well, I probably didn't call it grotesque, but um, I, you have, I have lots and lots of dreams. I dream at night. I dream during the day. It just, things happen. And, and I've learned that sometimes those images find their way into my work, but that's always, um, it's nothing to be afraid of. I uh, see, I don't paint, make paintings um, because they're marketable. I make paintings for the sake of making paintings. And that's the way I always have been. And so I don't care if you like it. I, <laughs> I do, but I don't. Because, uh, the, like I said, the, the, and I think we're all pretty much this way. It's the getting there that's the art. And what you end up with is just a byproduct. So sometimes people, things do come, become a little bit, you might refer to as grotesque, but that's okay. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Maybe not. Yeah. Am I muted? Okay. No, that's okay. Okay. Thanks, man. I'm just very great. I'm just very grateful to have the opportunity to have worked at this this uh, lifestyle and this this kind of uh, thing my whole life. I mean, since I was seventy or since 70, I went back to college in 1970, 71, after I got out of the military and all that stuff. And I've just been very lucky to be full time at this since, since 1979 with the love with the love and support of my wife and and a lot of people, you know. It, and it's it's a gift. I didn't choose this. Keith didn't choose this, and neither did you. It's just what we do, and you can't deny that. That then it would become wrong, I think. Yeah. So you know, it'd become wrong if we ignored that ignored that gift you know so we just work at it and just keep going okay thank you roger uh let's see have another we have a question from donna for john uh john for our folks not here or from the state, uh, can you share a little more about the agate that you use in your work? Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, that agate is profound in a way to me personally, uh, even through this, um, through this venue of, of, of uh, the uh, gift exhibition, the agate did come to me as a gift. And so that gift put me on a journey. And I eventually understood a lot of the geology here in South Dakota. And through geology, I, would, I could really tell a long story about, about what sacredness really means, you know. Uh, but the agate uh, came up during the uplift of the Black Hills. So it even predates uh, what I call our emergence out of the Wind Cave. <laughs> so it's very ancient. It's uh, and our creation story is, uh, you know, the first rock, you know, and he himself was an amorphic being who, through a, met a geologic metamorphosis, turned, turned himself inside out and became brittle and his blood created water. So I kind of made a cultural connection to this agate that is very rare. It's one of the few agates that are formed in water. It was formed in the limestone that surfaced during the uplift of the Black Hills, which was the Minnelusa Rock Formation. And so you can understand that it's been estimated to be about a half a billion years old. And this agate is only found in this area, uh, just in the eastern range of the Black Hills and the alluvial gravel field that carries these broken agates all the way down into uh, northern Nebraska, particularly around Crawford, Nebraska. So this alluvial gravel field 
was part of the original rock formations that came up in the uplift of the Black Hills. So this is significant to this area, and it's also a rare agate that in all the world of agates, there are other agates are formed in metamorphic rock formations. And uh, it's uh, what we call it the uh, um, igneous rock formations, but these are formed in the water, which to me is coincides with the sacredness of and the story of our creation, how water was created. To me, in our creation story, Eni had many little relatives. So these are close, close relatives of Eni, if not part of Eni himself, because each one of these agates are so individual in color and banding, you know, there's, there's no two alike. And that feeds into my creativity when I make uh, dormant pieces with them for some reason. They speak to me in a sense of how they're going to be part of my creation as well. And rocks are very sacred to native people, you know. So it's something that, you know, I, I, I do, you know, tell people when you have these or we come and see these agates that I have, maybe one will speak to you. That's your connection to create, to creation, especially for the people. And it's a resource right here in our homeland. So that's what I mean. I teasingly say I don't use anything from Hobby Lobby. I use things that are here in our homeland. <laughs> Yeah, so that agate is so unique to South Dakota. They call it Fairburn because of the little town uh, just below the front range of the Black Hills on the eastern prairie there. That's where there's a famous agate bed. That's where they were first found. But they're found all the way in the alluvial gravel field and out into the Badlands, you know. So I would say my creativity starts by even hunting for these agates, looking for them, but I don't look for them anymore. They're kind of hard to find, so I let them find me. But when I'm hunting the rocks, I find many other things too. So a lot of my creativity involves other stones that are found in the Black Hills and out in the prairies and the Badlands. Valuable resource. I call them prairie gems. Thank you. Thank you. Trying to see if I've missed any questions. Carolyn, do we have any questions on Facebook? I don't want to overlook Carolyn that. Carolyn just put a question in the chat. Okay. So, yeah, Carolyn, oh. Oh, go ahead, Abby. Okay. Um, for all the artists, I'm curious to know your approach or thought process when you're asked by Craig Howe to create a work for one of the Cairns exhibit or exhibitions. Does it help you to have the specific narrative or theme to begin with? Well, I do know that he insists that we stay with the narrative because a lot of the stories that are, are the, 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 the stories that we're talking about, they have many, many different, some of them have several different interpretations. So he wants us to stay with the, the one that he's presenting, even though we don't always agree with it. Um, and it, it's sometimes it's really difficult. I'm getting kind of tired of doing them actually. Um, but, wow. uh, it's, uh, but it's necessary. It's, it's necessary that we take part in these things and support each other. So the next one, I think, is going to be on Lewis and Clark or something. So that'll be interesting. Well, I could say about uh, Craig and the exhibitions he came up with, I thought the narratives that he gave me or whatever, these are things that I call that just kind of fell into my lap because I, I know all those stories that he was talking about. And Roger brings up a point because there's a lot of diversity in these stories, you know, and I, uh, not to disagree, I just realized that there, there's a lot of diversity in how these stories were, were told you know, we, we across Lakota land, we, we have different communities in Teoshpais, and sometimes we even have different dialects within Teoshpais from one, from Rosebud, the way up north into Canada, all, that, all over. So we are diverse in that sense, but we have a common belief about our, our origins and such, you know. 
So these stories actually did a lot, I would say, to help uh, not only me, but other artists to connect their creativity to a foundation that is more based in reality, the our, our identity, than anything abstract, you know, that's been um, overlaid on the top of what we really are, you know. So to me though, these, these stories actually, with every generation of, uh, you know, I like I mentioned the original inhabitants of the reservation and first and second generation. We're, we're talking right now, we're on the fourth, fifth and sixth generation of people that were forced onto the reservation and how much are we really diluting our culture, you know? So things like that, I guess, just to express it through the, through the venue of creativity is another way of enforcing our sovereignty, I would say, you know? So it, it really does bring to light a, an importance of uh, something to re-contribute to the next seven generations. Stories back then were the only mediums, but today we have so many other mediums of expressing stories now. Go ahead, Duane, you can go next. <laughs> All right, I could if you want me to. <laughs> uh, my, my answer is probably kind of short. Um, I think that it, it is a great, um, you know, vision that, that Dr. Howe is, is manifesting and he has manifested through these exhibitions. I love the, um, you know, heart that's behind, you know, wanting to tell these Lakota stories with the Lakota voice. And I also know that it heavily relies upon the artists, you know, and we're contributing a communication that's going beyond vocal. It's, it's these um, visuals, you know, that are really the importance of communication for humankind overall. The way we communicate as human beings is more nonverbal than anything. So I think that having our visuals in, involved is, is really amplifying the narrative a lot more. But also bringing a lot of that spiritual, um, I guess, grounding, centering, and authenticity. You know, just even gaining this uh, inheritance, this intergenerational inheritance that we're not just speaking for ourselves and, and illustrating a passage, but really trying to speak with a voice that represents Tiosh by or even extended relationships that go beyond comprehension. So for me, it's like, that's definitely a reason to get on board, but I also feel like I don't want to be selfish all the time and then be uh, an artist some, some of the times. Like sometimes I have to step back too and kind of give a little bit of like just recognition of what's taking place because this is big. It's pretty dynamic when you talk about some of these creation stories or even the whole history that's surrounding uh, Wounded Knee. Well, these are some hard things to, to bring to the surface for discussion or dialogue. So I look at the artists, and again, like I, I said earlier, I'm, I'm encouraged by the artists that I see here, but also others, and that usually makes me jump on board as well, too. But I also, um, you know, hope that in the future that some of this discussion that we're having tonight, well, even like just our presence being here for this uh, artist chat, Will, will help uh, those affiliated with the arts in our state understand the importance of artists. And even that title, like when we start thinking about, well, who is an artist? You know, that what are the dimensions to that, you know, really? And even when it starts to become more specific, like, well, if you're a Lakota artist, what does that represent? Really, what are you, you know, doing? And what are you saying behind your work? And I think that it's been cool for me, in my own opinion, just to see these works that have been a part of these shows because I've seen honesty. I've seen a lot of just, you know, real, real strong honesty. And I think as a viewer of art, that's the one thing I always want to receive is something that's speaking honestly to me. And it's not going to be only uh, something that's just superficial or, or, or kind of like uh, degrading my intelligence or my spirit or my soul. <clears throat> so that's kind of my thoughts. Every time Craig comes out, I remember the first time he came up and asked me if I'd be part of this. Uh, I got, I can't, I, uh, there's been so many of them. I can't remember the first one. Uh, creation story. Creation story? Yeah. Virgins was the first one. Yeah, that's, uh, I was, I was, you know, it was a challenge because um, 
as an artist, like Roger was mentioned earlier, you create the concept or not concept, the dream that you have in your heart to put down on as an image and uh, to have somebody else to come and tell you their dream and have you create that is, is difficult. And uh, the exciting thing about it is though, is um, it gives you a chance to learn um, a little something about yourself, the people you're from and uh, all, all the stuff that was built for you. Uh, that, that's, that's the thing that you got to hold up. You can't drop that. So, uh, and somebody come and ask me to participate uh, was very, I was very honored by that. Um, I still am. Um, it's always exciting to uh, talk to Dr. Dr. Howe about uh, some of the things that uh, that uh, that's possible for these exhibits and uh, growth uh, of, of our art and uh, our stories. Um, it, it's uh, on a human level, it's it, it makes you feel uh, connected. Uh, unlike anything else out there in the world. So I have to say that uh, being part of this always makes me feel uh, humbled by that in itself. That's it. Had you do. I, I was just thinking that I, I'm always grateful every time I go to my studio and and do some work. I'm always grateful for having been blessed with this this gift, whatever it is. And I haven't really fully defined it yet, but because every time we make a piece of art and I don't care or, or personal adornment or whatever, every artist kind of, whether they know it or not, they're exposing a piece of themselves. You're kind of telling people, you're letting people in on who you are. And, and, I, and I like to think of that because I'm exposing myself, which gives young people that are looking at my work and any, anybody that's looking at my work, the right to, to uh, do it themselves. It's giving them encouragement. I want to think of it as being encouraging to them to uh, express themselves in, in their own way. And I think that that's, that's really important. That's part of our mission, you know, as artists uh, to, uh, to kind of let other people in on what you, who you are and what you're about and, and encourage them to, to proceed with whatever they want to do. And I think that's really important. To be grateful. If you can. All right. That was a, a really wonderful uh, closing comment. You might have noticed we're getting to 6.30 and if there are any final comments from the artists, um, I welcome them. Okay, and just to briefly go back, um, so Dwayne Wilcox's book is actually at the South Dakota Art Museum's museum store. So if you are in Brookings and you're coming to the museum and you're interested in the book, um, again, that was visual language, the ledger drawings of Dwayne Wilcox. So you can pick it up there. And um, with that, I'll hand it over to Donna to close us out. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here and for sharing not just your art with us, but this little piece of yourself as you help, you know, explain your art to us and share it with us in this way. And, um, you know, I really appreciate hearing how much there's this interest in inspiring the next generation of artists because we feel very strongly about it, that at the museum. John, I loved hearing your comment about how that, that dance regalia inspired you. You never know where that inspiration is going to come from tonight. And that's one of the reasons that we post these things online so that everybody can really look back and enjoy them and that there is 
uh, this legacy of creativity that can be continue to, to be shared and explored. So I just wanna thank you all, Keith, Roger, Dwayne, John, for chatting with us tonight and to all of our audience members who joined us from near and far. We also want to thank Dr. Craig Howe of Cairns for curating this really stunning exhibition and for his ongoing partnership with the South Dakota Art Museum. And just to remind you to please join us again next Thursday, June 30th for the next virtual artist chat with three more artists featured in the gift. We'll be talking to Angela Babby, Ronell White Buffalo, and Andrea Leckberg. So have a great evening, everyone. Stay safe and have a lovely summer. <laughs>